Welcome to Advanced Manufacturing Media's webinar series. My name is Patrick Worsniak, Senior Editor of Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which is part of SME's Advanced Manufacturing Media. I'm very excited to host today's webinar, Advancements in Robotics, How Collaborative Robotics Can Bring Manufacturing Back to North America, with Nicholas DeKaiser, New Applications Business Line Manager, ABB. Our sponsor, ABB, is a leading supplier of industrial robots, modular manufacturing systems, and service. A strong solutions focus helps manufacturers improve productivity, product quality, and worker safety. ABB has installed nearly 300,000 robots worldwide. At Manufacturing Engineering, we're following the developments in collaborative robot robotics and how these new machines can improve factory productivity and expand into new automation applications. Nicholas DeKaiser is New Applications Business Line Manager, ABB. Nicholas is a Belgian national holding a Master of Science in Applied Economics and International Management from the University of Antwerp in Belgium. He joined ABB's Robotics Business Unit in 2007 in Shanghai, China as a product manager for the small robot. Nicholas later took on the global business development responsibility for the 3C, electrical and electronics industry segment, and worked as a key account manager for prominent consumer electronics companies. Recently, Nicholas moved to the United States to take on his current role as new applications business line manager in the robotics business unit. You will be able to ask questions after Nicholas' presentation using the Q&A box that will appear on the right side of the screen. Time permitting, these will be answered following the presentation. If time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we will make sure the answers are emailed to you. And with that, I'll pass this presentation over to Nicholas. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for attending this webinar. I'm uh, definitely excited to be able to present to you about uh, some of the advancements we've done in this area. And uh, really, I mean, throughout this presentation, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through some real-life examples also that will show how um, manufacturing can effectively be brought back to the United States to high-cost economies. So um, as a first step, I would like to go and uh, move on to discuss a little bit about the synopsis of the presentation and you get a better feel of what to expect going forward. What we see is that the robots are increasingly being used in a lot of new ways in markets that they've never been before. Uh, and you could see that in, especially in the area of small and medium parts assembly, simple material handling tasks where traditionally either low-cost labor or hard automation was used. And now, as I mentioned earlier, through some real-life examples, we will discover throughout the session that flexible as well as collaborative robotic automation manufacturing technologies and practices will make the Made in the USA a profitable strategic alternative to limited use hard automation or outsourcing production to low-cost distant countries. On that note, let's see and take a deeper look at what reasons uh, people and corporations have to consider outsourcing. Some of those reasons could be, well, I'm dealing with a capital-intensive process, and I don't necessarily have the money to handle that. Uh, my processes have a very high labor contract, and other countries have lower wages, so that seems to be the logical thing to do. Next one up would be, well, I have uh, safety issues, and I don't want to put my own people at risk. Or I have environmental issues, and you know, dealing with that can be very expensive in a highly re regulated economy uh, in terms of environment. And then finally also, well, it's not really our core competency to assemble these or to produce those. But then really a question you should ask yourself, what is your core competence? A uh, deeper look into each of these reasons brings us to, to those next few uh, points. Think about the high labor and, and the logical answer to say let's go outsource. Well, is that really 
uh, the right answers. Think about all the other costs that you should consider. And some of the typical one would be the transportation cost involved, moving goods back to um, your country or the, the actual market where you'll be selling your goods, all the duties, the local taxes, harbor fees, cost of inventory, the impact you have on managing that. Those are kind of, I would say, very traditional one, but is that really all? And there's a whole bunch of other reasons that, or at least issues you definitely need to consider and try to understand the cost impact of that. Travel is, uh, is one of the first ones. Not traveling in terms of going to, to go and see your plan, but managing the quality, having the executive teams going back and forth between the far, far away plant and the headquarters. This, this can be very put to very high cost. Uh, think about additional management, additional planning. One of the typical ones we see a lot these days is the, uh, the turnover in low-cost countries. Uh, you can think about a typical electronic plant that would, uh, in China, employ, let's say, 10, up to 50,000 people. I've, I've even seen bigger ones. If you have a 10% turnover of employees or out of a workforce of 50,000. That's 5,000 people that you need to replace every year. If you divide that by 300 for uh, working days, that's roughly 20 people every day that you'd have to bring in. Think about the HR impact you have, the cost, the training, uh, the managerial headaches, and so on. Time zone difference is another classical one, uh, having to be basically working around the clock so you can always be in touch with your factories. I mean, I'm not going to go through all of those, but I think it's it's very important to think of all of those and then put them into a cost model and really understand what that means to you and if outsourcing is still the right answer. Safety concern. Well, hey, I have something that's, you know, I'm dealing with hot, heavy, uh, sharp parts. I'm doing a very repetitive motion that's not very ergonomic. Uh, yes, I'm dealing with that. Then the next question you ask yourself, well, uh, is it something that's, uh, environmentally unfriendly. Well, it happens to be two. And then the conclusion is go to let's our source. But is that really the right thing to do? Is that morally what you should do? How about thinking about engineering a better solution? And some of some of the actually the first example I will use uh, later on uh, through a video, you'll clearly see how that can be avoided and you don't need to necessarily go and outsource to uh to address those issues. And then uh, Last one that I want to quickly go through is, well, you know, I want to outsource my non-core competencies. But what, what is a core competency? Well, I guess, is that something you do well? Is that something that others are not capable of doing? But probably we want to think, what is really important to your customer? I mean, that would be your core competence. So let's consider the customer for a, for a while. I mean, what does the customer want from you? What, what, what do, as if you would be the customer from, a, from your supplier? You want him to be giving you the right product. You want him to give you a reliable product. You want him to be responsive so that you can, as a, as a, as a supplier, can give, be very responsive and provide the direct answer. And it's always good to have feeling that your supplier cares about you and has a relationship with you. Now, if you outsource all of your production, it's going to be real hard to go and bring this right, reliable, and responsive uh, relationship to your customer. So definitely think about that. And that brings, uh, brings us to the next point in my presentation where we're going to go and look a little bit on how robotics and also collaborative robotics for assembly or other applications can really boost productivity and enable reshoring. Before diving into this, uh, I'd like to look at a couple of quotes that I found in a recent survey from the Boston Consulting Group. They're an independent group. They're, this is not commissioned by any automation industry or robotic industry. This was just a completely independent study looking at how uh, manufacturers will start with use robots and what impact that would have uh, on the U.S. Uh, product manufacturing. So what they have come up with in that study that was performed and uh, published last year is that in the next decade, uh, we will see that there will be a significant acceleration of utilization of robots uh, as they become cheaper and also have the ability to perform more tasks. 
that also will and that will then uh, get, have a constraining effect on the payable flow. Now, they also see that the way you the, the calculus of manufacturing will be changed because of advanced robotics. If you think now in the United States and you take electronics manufacturing, utilizing a robot for a routine assembly test would cost you about four dollars an hour. If you take an average worker, the total cost for that would be around twenty-four dollars. So right there, you got your savings uh, right in front of you. Uh, they mentioned that about 1.2 million additional advanced robots are expected to be deployed by 2025, and that's that's a giant leap. If you think that at this point in time, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 40,000 robots are being deployed on a yearly basis in the United States. Uh, if you extrapolate that to 10 years, that's a, that's a really big growth, and that's also what they say is that within two years we'll see the growth of robots going to 10% a year rather than the current annual growth of 2 to 3%. And that kind of explains the exponential growth they're expecting. And all that will then also enable reshoring as well as rising exports and add 2.5 up to 5 million factory jobs in the U.S. in the next five years. Finally, also, the surge in robotics will spawn smaller factories, which will then easily replicate small assembly systems and then serve local markets with customized products. Think about what we mentioned just earlier uh, about core competences, about being responsive and delivering exactly what your customer wants. Having that small local factory is a great tool uh, for a supplier or a manufacturer to have. And if we go and want to look a little bit at how evolution of automation, the history of automation throughout high and low cost economies, how that kind of moved over the years, uh, understand a little bit. Understanding the past kind of also helps uh, confirm and, and gives you a good feeling of what the future may hold. Going back to the 60s and before, in the HCC, so the high cost country, so to say, manufacturing was done very ma in a very manual way. You had some heavy machinery, obviously, but you didn't have automation. And there was there was really not much manufacturing at all going on in the local countries. Going in the 80s, you could see hard automation sprawling, uh, making a lot of the same products really quick, really effectively. And the 80s also brought manufacturing uh, of consumer goods and so on to the local countries, in, uh, but still very manually. In the 90s, we could see that there started to be a trend of moving uh, some of uh, to low cost countries, some of the high volume production, and take care of the, take advantage of the cheap manual operation that those low cost low cost countries had to offer. That was 90s, 2000s. Around now, 2010, um, you would see that flexing automation for low volume, high mix production uh, is is something being more and more uh, utilized in the high cost countries. But in the low-cost countries, you really see a automation trend that starts both for high-volume operations as well as low-volume, high-mix operations. Right there, they're facing three choices today. They, they go hard automation. They go robot, flexible automation. And they have even another choice where they say, well, you know what? I'm still moving to an even lower-cost country. But that has, uh, that's, that's a fairly complicated task, if you think of it. Uh, supply chain needs to follow. Infrastructure is not necessarily there. So keep moving to the lower cost country may not be the right solution. Yet they are, those are part of the trends. But if we go and look to the future, you could really see, and you'll see throughout the presentation and, and actually throughout what I will present to you in the next slide, that flexible as well as collaborative optimization for all types of production is, is where you can have an answer for both countries and kind of uh, give you a more uniform way on how you can manufacture. And the location of manufacturing will start to lose uh, its importance. And it's more the way you, you build stuff than where you build stuff. So what is this driver for human-machine collaboration? And this, um, this chart here, which was done by uh, Professor Lothar uh, back in Germany, gives you a number of aspects of uh, manufacturing I would put into a, into a number of uh, pillars uh, from high to low, and then you can see where, what type of assembly slots went. If you think about a low, uh, low lot sizes with high number of variants, things that you know 
when you build one-offs or very short lots. What you'll need there is typically your productivity for such, uh, such products will be low, uh, but the flexibility needed in your production will be very high. That's where manual assembly kind of still fits the bill and will probably keep being relevant uh, for, you know, forever probably. Uh, manual assembly is still a very viable method for those type of, uh, when you have those type of problems to deal with. Now, if you're thinking about a lower number of variants but big lot sizes, your flexibility needs won't be as high. However, you probably need to produce a lot. And that's where automatic assembly comes in. And if you go really to the right spe right of spectrum of the of that chart, you'll, you'll even look at hard automation as being the right solution. But the more you go into the chart, you want to get more and more flexibility and use more of, you know, versatile, flexible robot. But then you have this big, big area in the middle, which until recently was totally unaddressed. Uh, and you'd be surprised, or maybe you won't be surprised, but you, you see a lot of, um, you see a lot of manufacturers, a lot of companies dealing with products that kind of fit right in the middle here. They're not, they're not very low in volume. They're not very low in uh, lot size, but they are they're kind of in the middle. And collaborative assembly really addresses that gap very well and allows you to then uh, produce much more and not having to jump either into manual, either into full automatic. That brings us to the next section of the presentation where we're going to look through actual use cases, uh, how robotic automation was implemented successfully. Uh, it's not all necessarily collaborative robotics, because some some processes don't lean themselves to that. However, they do allow um, a more, uh, so how would I put it? I mean, they, they would allow people and robots to work in the same plan in a more effective way. And again, uh, will give you some proof and some elements to understand how that insourcing or uh, avoiding outsourcing was made possible. The first example I will use is, uh, is for mo uh, mode of manufacturing process of uh, the ABB, an ABB Balder plant here in Fort Smith in the United States. Key challenges that that factory faced was that they were really concerned about safety and cleanliness in the factory. They had to deal with heavy and hot components and, uh, of course, try to deal with potential uh, that could cause injuries with those type of parts. And naturally improve the cost competitiveness of products as, a, as an overall paradigm. Solution for uh, handling that was to insource and invest heavily in automation. And you'll see now, uh, we'll move into a video where you'll see a mix of robots utilized for die casting, winding of motors, as well as handling the material, uh, handling those motors. Uh, I would like to give you a little notice on those videos. Uh, they they sometimes get a little bit blurry at times, but that doesn't mean you have a problem with your network. It's just the way the compression format is. Most of the videos are pretty clear, but if it gets blurry, uh, just wait a second or two and it will sharpen up again. The first video will be starting in a couple of seconds. Just give it some time to load. It should have started pretty much everywhere now. The first process you see here are pretty heavy, dirty die casting processes. So small robot going in to spray lubricant into the machine. So the, the, these are not good environments for people, obviously. And you wanna you wanna automate there uh, at all cost. You you have to handle these heavy parts, and then you have to bring them further down the line so that they can get assembled in the final product. But as you see here. Still, people are, uh, being able to enclose that in a certain area, people were still move, working close by and be able to collaborate in a certain um, instance when the robot is uh, finished in its own section, give on the part, and the, robot, the people could work in a safe, cleaner environment with the parts and not being mixed altogether. You see some robots here handling the parts. As you see, they're getting more finished. Those are the cores of the motors that are being moved. And then those cores are being handled and then moved into the winding machines. As you 
which you'll see right here as the motors are getting wind, warned that later on they would move back out. The robot will do all that material handling. So that will be for the first example. That was done recently in the United States. There is a there is a much longer video actually available about that plant with a whole article. And uh, for anyone that would be interested, I'd be very happy to share that. Uh, just you know, shoot a note or a question after the presentation, and uh, we can we can definitely share more of these resources and examples. Benefits again, just to highlight the benefits of that particular plant is that they were able to increase their productivity while keeping a consistent headcount and uh, reduce their footprint, manufacturing footprint. Clearly, you could see that there was a improved safety of work environment, not having to deal with those lubricants and spraying and so on. No people close there, close by there. Then uh, they increased the production flexibility. That allows them to create more complex and customer, customizable customer solutions. If they have a flexible production apparatus with those robots, they can serve their customer better and, do, and produce what the customer required and didn't have to standardize everything to one single product. Um, but again, well, when some, something we, we were discussed earlier. And finally, it also allows the manufacturing to stay close to the customer base, providing faster deliveries as well as local support. The next example is a circuit breaker factory in Italy uh, that used predominantly hard automation at some point, some manual labor too, to produce those circuit breakers. They had to, they had some challenges. They needed to increase capacity as uh, the demand was growing. They needed to meet savings targets um, by creating new production lines for new products, combat the ever increasing labor costs they faced in Italy and again, improve cost competitiveness of the products overall. I think that's something that anyone strives any day of the week, really. Same, same, uh, same answer here. They're insourcing and investing in automation. About 40 robots used in that plant for different, a bunch of different tasks, from a mix of soldering to welding to packaging, as well as actual assembly tasks. Let's load up the video. That's where those are the products being manufactured, thermomagnetic circuit breakers. And you can see in the background, uh, one of the robots, you have a little bit of a, of a, a caption there that you can read about how the, the people in the plant like to utilize the robots and all the benefits that brought them, that, that brought them. So small robots throughout the plant making small handling tasks, small insertion tasks. So as you can see, some parts are inserted in the breaker. So really, uh, assembly tasks in that case. The whole, uh, the whole plant has a shuttle conveyor going station to station. And what this uh, gentleman is actually saying now, is, was that, was that was mentioned earlier, is that having both of us, it created them the opportunity to be more flexible with their product design. What they also found is that when they had to create a new automation station, automated station, robots were helping them design the new automated station much much quicker than when they were using hard automation because of the flexibility of the product. This is a testimony to their growth in production that went up uh, from one million to two and a half million uh, over the span of ten to twelve years. And they did that keeping the exact same amount of personnel. So there was no need for layoffs, but also no need to hire more and, uh, and create, uh, you know, fluctuation in getting contractors in and out. They were able to just automate their production increase step by step. Uh, also, last I heard is that, well, they used 40 robots at the time of we created the video. By now, I think the, the count of robots to the plant as they continuously find ways to improve and uh, automate um, and increase production, moved up to 60%. You saw small robots, you saw a bigger robot earlier that was handling uh, more of the inventory. And uh, what you'll see here in the last section of the video is how we use uh, 
top-mounted Delta-type robots to go and insert uh, in a fairly fast pace some of the parts. So in, in, that's kind of in the fastest section of the line at the end where you have top-down insertion. A quick little recap on the benefits. As I mentioned, the productivity improvement of 250% over 10 years, and also uh, reducing the manufacturing footprint there drastically. Quality was improved. Uh, they had a rejection rate that was about 3%. 10 years ago, they're close to zero right now. Robots versus hard automation are also very energy efficient. A robot just uses the right energy uh, for the motion it needs to do. Uh, and doesn't always speak to max energy. Therefore, you look at 30% consumption um, reduction in energy consumption, which uh, these days is another very important part of uh, what people look at in manufacturing. Product cost was improved, and um, some of the other aspects we already mentioned. The last uh, value that they had here, and that's maybe a little bit of a softer value, you would, some may say, but Utilizing those white robots and having kind of this, uh, a lot of white elements in the plant gave a very nice sense of cleanliness, gives a very luminosity, a lot of luminosity to the plant and gave an impression of surgical precision. And that has, that has in turn a couple of benefits. First of all, it reflects really well on the product and on the brand. So if your customers visit the plant and they see how it's built, it gives a, it gives a very good feeling. The other thing, it also creates employee satisfaction, having a very Nice environment, clean, uh, also more quiet environment. Uh, robots are much more quiet than hard automation. So for the people, it was a better place to work. Moving ahead, uh, and uh, I used uh, an example of a plant in China. And now you would be thinking, okay, well, I thought we were talking about insourcing and not offshoring. Why are we talking about China right now? Well, it's actually... Clearly, uh, I did that on purpose to bring that up, is that this particular plant has now integrated over 80, I think close to 100 robots these days to manufacture wireless mice and keypads. And, and really the conclusion before I, I, I can draw some quick conclusion before showing the rest is that well, if they could do that in China and if they need to automate it all there, well, what really stopping in a higher cost economy to do the exact same thing? And that's a question we can all ask ourselves. But for them, it made sense, so I would think that it makes even more sense here. They were, they're, they're fighting with the increase in labor costs. For those of you who have been dealing with China and uh, do, a, do manufacture there, over the last five to eight years, every year the, the labor cost goes up 15%, and it doesn't seem to stop at the moment. So that's a, that's a drastic increase in cost. And then I mentioned that in the very beginning of the presentation about the difficulty of recruiting people and retraining, retaining skills and competent workforce. You know, when we talked about the turnover, it's a real issue there. So uh, in the next step, I'll show you the video uh, that, that then brings a lot of different applications to light. Uh, it's a very fast-paced video, so you won't necessarily have time to see all of the applications in detail. Again, uh, not a problem. You can you can find this video also online on, on our website, and I can share it with you. I do have to point to something: is that the safety equipment and the way they approach on the plant safety and automation safety is not according to U.S. guidelines. Uh, it, uh, it was done according to their own uh, guidelines at that plant, and they, they took liberty with self integration to do this. So if for them, it works. Um, there's, of course, no reason we couldn't add more safety to the plant in a, in a different setting. Now, that also brings up another point, is that if, you, if in this case, we're not using collaborative robots in this plant, but utilizing collaborative robotics with the same, with the same applications and the same handling that you'll see in, um, in that video is, is definitely a perfect possibility, and I would even think a logical next step. And, and that would actually bring the safety... Uh, configuration of that plan back in uh, into something that we can accept here in the United States, utilizing collaborative robots. So think, when you're looking at that, just think about collaborative robots and put them in uh, put them into that perspective. And we'll end the presentation with some uh, collaborative robots uh, in action, and then you can try to picture that for yourself. So here, the video starts. 
Yeah, there may be some blurry, uh, blurry uh, little moments in the video, but just uh, I will sharpen up straight after. The robots are utilized from the very beginning uh, of the of the assembly process, where it's dealing with the PCB boards, loading them into the uh, those PCB lines and the, the boards, and then unloading them. They're used in kitting for later on in the in the assembly plants, so that they parts on trays, you can see them handing over parts to one another. They are used for uh, some accurate assembly, accurate insertion. If you, if you take a wireless mouse and you would pull it apart, you'll see there's a whole bunch of components in there. All of them are assembled through robots. That company created their own lab also where they would test and develop new applications so they could bring up uh, new robots in a, in a fast way and have that core competence on how to integrate robots internally and be able to move quickly. I think if you have that many robots in your plant, that definitely makes sense to have that type of uh, setup to be reactive for your own automation needs. In the last passage, you can see st still some people working on the line. Obviously, uh, a robot can't answer all the questions. So again, the collaborative aspect uh, comes into play what the robots can do, the human can, and if they can work side by side, it makes it very easy to implement. Here you see a completely integrated uh, setup of how to manufacture keyboards. What you don't see is that further down in the line, there's an actual molding machine in doing the keys. So the robot is preparing the keyboard that gets close to the molding machine, the keys get inserted, the robot finishes the work, and around the molding machine, you have uh, you have a whole keyboard manufactured actually, and and that again from a footprint perspective, instead of having a molding shop and then an assembly shop, you can integrate all in one using automation. And you can see they standardized on the same type of robot all across the plant. So one one type of flexible robot can do a whole uh, risk of handling. And for maintenance people um, amongst you, definitely a uh, a plus to have only one type of tool to deal with and not having a multitude of different robots and different automation mechanisms. Just use one standard six-axis arm to solve all your problems across. So some additional benefits that this plant saw is that they could also flex, uh, manage the peaks in customer demand. One typical thing that you see, uh, and that's uh, typically for China, they have uh, national holidays once in a while, uh, you know, three times a year. And during those national holidays, they, you know, virtually shut down the plants. People go back home. They're migrant workers. They may go back 2,000 miles or 1,000 miles from when the plant is, only come back two weeks later. When that happens, that doesn't these moments don't necessarily match when other markets across the world need the products. So when that situation happens, it's easy to have. It's much better to have automation that can keep working than people coming and going and having to restart and retrain them. The other thing that uh, they kind of were able to communicate to us is that, that typically within two years in the Chinese economy and the Chinese uh, economic data that you would use for uh, for workers, it's, it was a two-year payback for any of the installation they would do. So. It's pretty pretty reasonable, and uh, if you would put in U.S. data in that calculation, I'm pretty sure you'll see the payback within one year rather than two. So, right towards the end of the presentation, I have two more two more examples I want to show you. One will be without video, but it's a uh, it's a very nice uh, very nice facility in Germany, and then the next one will be a, a collaborative example. That's um, an example of a iron producer. Uh, called Roventa, they're in Germany. They went from a fully manual type of assembly to a full-scale flexible automated plant and using about 60 small robots in the plant in the process, uh, to do that, doing all types of processes from gluing to assembling to screwing to soldering, pretty much anything you'd have to do to build a, an iron. The reason they went to do that is they said, well, we want to keep our high-end high production uh, high-end irons. We want to keep them in Germany. We won't have the Made in Germany brand for that, but we can't do it manually anymore. It's just economically, it was not viable anymore. So they had to automate. They built an in-house integration and engineering team so they could do everything in-house themselves, and now 
they have this plant running about 9,000 units per day. What's really nice about this plant is that irons are kind of built in the same way, but can, can be different in shapes and colors, but at least the manufacturing um, setup is, is the same as uh, the, the different steps. And so they can run very short batches, smaller than 1,000 unit batches, and do changeovers. Changeovers can take 5 to 15 minutes. Since everything is flexibly automated, there's very little mechanical interaction when they do changeovers in that line. Well, they just change uh, the program. All the robots reposition themselves according to the new product that has different shapes. A couple of fixtures need to be changed left and right, but they do very quick changeovers and therefore, again, can do special editions, seasonal editions. Uh, you know, if they have a Black Friday iron that they want to make that has a specific color and specific price point, they'll, they'll, they'll run a batch of 1,000 and then switch over back to their usual product. So very flexible tool. And very, very interesting. There is some inter some information about that plant in the media. Uh, if you'd be interested to learn more about it, the same thing. I'd be very happy to share that with you and, uh, and point you the right way. And that brings us to uh, to the to towards the end of the presentation, where we'll, I want to point out a little bit more about collaborative robots. And I'm going to use uh, the new robot that was launched by ABB uh, throughout the summer, a robot called Yumi. Which, uh, which is the first truly collaborative assembly robot uh, available on the market today. A couple of key, key points when you look at, uh, at Yumi. Well, collaboration, what does that mean? And how does that, what does that mean for, for Yumi as a robot? Well, it's designed for integration in manual assembly lines. So think about an existing manual assembly line today and bring in the robot past it. So no need to make any major changes into the actual uh, assembly line to be able to have Yumi come and work on it. What, what also that will bring you is that it will bring you that as a customer, you could potentially save investments for this all additional safety equipment that you would typically need if you would change your type of line. Now, we point out potentially because a collaborative robot can only be as collaborative and as safe as its own as the application. Uh, we always use the traditional way of saying, well, what if the robot is assembling a knife and holding a knife? Well, the knife itself, obviously, is not something collaborative or something safe, so you'd have to still find a way to shield people for getting in contact with the knife. It has nothing to do with the robot. It has actually everything to do with the application. So that's, we can't always guarantee a collaborative system until we know what it's going to be doing. Flexibility. Uh, Yumi is, is extremely flexible as it supports scalable and agile production concept. Um, it, uh, it actually may also work very well in lean environments, which is uh, which many factories these days are uh, made of. And then finally, uh, also the customer can use one robot at mul for multiple applications and maybe potentially multiple locations in the plant. Yumi being fully self-contained and being a, a lightweight robot, it can be moved around the plant and do different tasks at the same workbench or at a different workbench. It's also an autonomous setup where material in it and outfit concept can be brought around the robot within the same footprint so that the robot can find parts in a effective way to, in, in, in a matter to assemble them later on. That, let's, show, uh, let's, let's come up with a short, short video showing Yumi assembling something in a collaboration with a person and then Let's dive a little bit deeper on some of the, the functionality. So what you see here is Yumi assembling a push button, uh, putting the two parts and then inserting them together. I will loop this video a couple of times as there's a couple of features I want to I wanna highlight as we see. The robot is, uh, from the surface of it, doing something fairly simple, taking two parts, placing them together, and then handing it over to the, to the operator that's going to handle a different part that needs to be snapped to get the end product. Well, in this particular case, what the operator does was something that would have been difficult for the robot to do because the press force required for that second operation was higher than the robot could handle. And if we would let the robot handle that higher press force, well, the robot will lose its collaborative aspects. 
because it would be able to exert too much force. So we la- we leave that in the control of the human, but we do what's not what what's safe. We leave we leave up to the person. I'm gonna reload the video. Second time. When you look at Yumi, you can see that when he picks up those parts, uh, if you want to look in detail, you're gonna see that he's gonna tap them together. So he's picking it up, placing it, and then. The next frame, we'll see how it's going to tap the part in there. And there's two taps, as you can see. So why did he do two taps? Well, Yumi has the ability to sense uh, forces as it uh, as it assembles. And in this case, it only did one tap. So it actually knows when the insertion happened. If it felt it didn't happen, it will give a second tap. If it still didn't happen, it will give a third tap. If it still didn't feel what it wanted to feel, it will say, well, maybe I failed the assembly or there's something wrong with the product. Let's let's put it in a reject bin just to make sure so you don't get uh, rejects on the phone. So that was one, one aspect of the, the force sensing of Yumi that you could see there with either one tap or multiple taps. Relooping the video another time. You see that at one point the robot is picking up uh, apart from the flex feeder, and we'll talk about the flex feeder later, it's doing a little side tap. So let's uh, let's wait until the frame gets back there. It's picking up apart from the feeder, right there. Now it's tapping it on that little fixture. So now why did he do that? That part, that little white part, has on one side has an edge, and on the other side is flat. That particular feature was not detectable by vision. So yet it was very important because depending whether the edge was up or flat, the robot would have to assemble it in the other direction. By tapping it, again, with the force sensing within the Yumi arm, it knows which orientation it has and it knows in which sense it needs to go and insert it. Very important little features that people do that automatically because people, when they assemble things, they have their fingers that are loaded, fingers and hands are loaded with sensors, your eyes are, are very powerful sensors, and it's all automatic for people. For automation to do that, it can be more complex. Now, with the, with the sensing capability of Yumi, you, you, you're able to address those problems in a nice and effective way. Uh, two more features I really want to talk about here is, one is the flex feeders, uh, and, and I'll, I'll show another picture of that later on, is when it, it's, it's how it's picking up its components. Small feeding devices that are compact and self-contained right next to the robot, bringing up parts that are typically loaded in bins into a system that then translates the bin problem or a three-dimensional problem into a two-dimensional problem by tossing those parts onto a flat pad that can then be, a camera can be looking at those parts and explain to Yumi uh, or orient Yumi to go and pick up those parts, as you can see, are randomly uh, disposed on the, on the screen of that feeding devices. That feeding devices can also be supplied uh, with Yumi. And then the final point, and maybe instead of relooping the video for that, I'll actually go and move on to the next slide so you have uh, still images looking at those. So those are the way Yumi is utilized and what is special about it. If you want to have an assembly machine that's collaborative, you want to make sure that it also has hands that are designed in a safe way and that are multifunctional. So those hands that you see here, or the, the grippers of Yumi, they come together with the robot, and they are uh, they are designed with a flexible shell, so they can absorb impact. They have fingers that are servo controlled and programmable, uh, so that the pinch force of those fingers is also within the collaborative um, realm. Now those fingers can be adapted to different shapes, and that's where you have to see if you're going to make fingers that are going to be sharp and uh, for, for picking up the objects, then you may lose the collaborative aspect of that. But if you keep rounded, nicely designed, soft fingers, you could stay. You could keep a fully collaborative hand in uh, with Yumi. That hand also has uh, the ability to have suction cups uh, on the side of it, and, uh, and therefore being able to pick up parts through vacuum. The hand also has the ability to incorporate a small camera, which then will allow you to inspect parts and look at parts. So a fully integrated gripping device with the robot. 
you also see that on the on this on this image that there is no no wiring, no uh, air hosing going to the hands, and that is because all of that is integrated through the arm of the robot, allowing it for a very clean, nice uh, aspect. I mean, it would not be very nice to have dangling cables, uh, vacuum cables going to the hand, and then collaborate with people. Those could be tangled in the robot. People could tangle with them. That doesn't really work in uh, in a collaborative environment. So having it all integrated into the arm through the gripper is a very nice feature. And last uh, last picture here is, is kind of showing how Yumi could sit side, side by side and gives you also a little bit of a better idea of the size factor. It's really modeled to the human torso in terms of size and for, therefore slotted in very nicely in the assembly line. You can see the picture here of a person looking at something, making maybe a final assembly while Yumi is, is assembling it on the side or maybe packing it to, to a box. I mean, you can make, make what you want from that. Uh, Again, a Yumi, even though it has, a, it can have a camera in its hand, may not necessarily be able to see everything that a human eye can see when it inspects the part, and therefore have a nice, uh, a nice complementarity between human and people. To end the presentation, I would like to quickly point out to some trends we can expect over the next two years, and clearly, small parts assembly in electronics, toy, shoe assembly, and other consumer industry goods are already in a growth phase in low-cost countries. Uh, but on more recently, we can see that Reshore Initiative, uh, these kind of applications clearly growing uh, for robot usage in the United States. And if you look at the robotic association data, uh, back in 2013, and that trend has been ongoing in 14 and 15, assembly application has been growing tremendously. And actually, the electronics industry uh, and the utilization of robots in the electronics industry has been growing too. We see a lot of traditional robots working in these spaces now and growing, uh, but with all these techniques uh, and affordable collaboration techniques, I would say, and, and robots coming on the market, you could see that uh, the growth will ever expand on that one. And finally, we see some more development in 3D vision as well as point cloud techniques, uh, which will enable robots to now much better understand their environment and therefore bring collaboration even to the next step. Uh, being able to know where you are, see what's going on, uh, it's, it's, uh, as a robot, uh, will help them work much more efficiently in a, in a collaborative environment. And on that note, I'd like to give the word back to Patrick to wrap up this uh, presentation. I'd like to very much thank you all for the attendance uh, and attention to this presentation and look forward to the Q&A section and answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas, for that informative session. As Nicholas has shown, collaborative robots are opening up a new and exciting applications throughout the field of robotics automation. We're going to try to get in a few questions here now. And if for some reason we don't get to you, your, an your question will be answered via email. Here's a question. Is the robot using a version of Pickmaster for the vision part pickup? So we, we're, we're not using Pickmaster in this case. Uh, Pickmaster we typically use um, to do and uh, handle with conveyor tracking. We do have an integrated vision, uh, integrated vision uh, software package that comes with Yumi, and that, that allows you for ease of use of the vision. Does Yumi have to have vision guidance to operate, or in some applications, can it operate without vision? It can work with either vision or not vision. It really depends on what you want to do. If your parts are the parts that you need to handle are located in defined position, you know you may not necessarily need it. So it's uh, it's just it really depends on the application. Uh, but we do see that vision is used almost all the time because it allows for a much more flexible environment uh, and allows you for not having to define everything in absolute locations in your assembly workspace, which is very often what, you know, when people assemble, nothing is absolutely defined where things are located. So bringing Yumi, you want to not change too much to that environment and use vision. Is Yumi easier or harder to program than a standard six-axis industrial robot? So 
Yumi has a lead through programming function. So what what that means is you can go and take the arm and move it around and record positions where you move the arm. So essentially to go and make simple programs is literally child's play. Anyone can learn how to program, how to make simple programs with Yumi within a minute. If you're going to go for very accurate uh, positioning, and we're talking about uh, repeatability is around 20 micron uh, that, that uh, Yumi can achieve, then of course you want to go and fine tune using traditional robot programming techniques. It's not, it's not any harder, it's just that you would need to use those traditional techniques. But you would have done most of the work already through those very simple techniques. Uh, then naturally if you need to use, uh, use vision, or if you need to go and integrate that line into an in, into a whole line flow, then there's other integration techniques that are, uh, I would say, from the traditional angle and, and uh, as well as vision. As collaborative robots advance, do you think they will be able to handle heavier and bigger parts? So if you look at uh, collaborative robots, the, you have different types. With Yumi, uh, what I mentioned very early, it's, uh, he, that one is truly collaborative, and the concept of Yumi being able to uh, collaborative at fairly high speeds does not um, does not lend itself to higher payload because moving high payloads at high speeds will never be collaborative. Uh, it's just uh, it's the same as a human handling a ten pound and moving and swinging it around. It's not it's not a safe situation. However, there are other ways where robots are dynamically changing their speed depending on presence of people, yes, those robots are our uh, ability to handle higher payloads, but we'll still always be probably with payloads that human can also handle. Uh, for now, we don't see any real collaboration with very heavy payloads, but this may come right now. I don't necessarily see it. How does it not hurt a human if there isn't safety features around the robot? So the Yumi itself is, is weak, so to say, or it's, uh, it, it's very lightweight construction. So it is actually, even if it would come in contact with the person, it would not hurt him. It's uh, also, uh, if you look at the robot, it's completely padded. Uh, so it's, it has soft surfaces. It has no pinch point, and it would stop. So also in case of contact with a person, it would immediately stop. Uh, it's a little bit the same thing. If you would be working next to someone and, and you would bump into one another, you would not you would not hurt each other. You would just say, okay, well, let's not bump into each other and stop doing it. And that's exactly what the robot uh, would would work with. And Yumi is, uh, I mean, the, the best way to kind of explain it is to come and see Yumi live at different trade shows. Uh, it will be uh, and actually go and, and play with the robot and see what it does, and then you'll you'll understand even better. How are the small parts replenished? There were only a couple of parts shown in the video. Yes, yeah, so the the bin underneath the conveyor, the the, the how to say, so it, it, you drop all the parts into the feeder, and it's a container for small parts. You can you can hold quite a few parts. You could probably put several hundred small parts into the bin, and then it bring it, it's actually coming out through an elevator to the surface. When it's empty. You can come in and just, you know, toss a bin in there manually. So let's say you produce a lot, you may have to come in every hour and drop. You could also use a hopper to bring in parts there, but we don't want to use too much heavy automation around that. And just dropping parts into the into the bin that's underneath the the plate is uh, is the easiest way. What is the maximum weight one arm of Yumi can take on? It's about 500 grams per arm. So. That actually also explains uh, previous question: Why does not you, why is Yumi not going to hurt anyone? Well, it's not lifting anything heavy. It doesn't need to be very strong to man manage 500 gram, but that allows it to be safe. And, and, and then just yeah, I just wanted to say also, if you think about small parts assembly, I always like to use the example of a, of an iPad Air, for instance. A tablet like that weighs one pound, 450 grams. All the components, sub-assemblies with that would be below that. So to assemble that type of products, you really don't need much more payloads. And given that you already have grippers that are designed for Yumi, you really get yourself a very effective payload still. Is, is Yumi programmed using the same language as standard IRC5 controllers? 
You can see the yes. standard pendant in the video. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the uh, exactly so the the language behind the, the underlying language is a standard rapid language from ABB. However, we have developed a higher level interface uh, where you have a much easier command uh, when you do the lead through programming, and that actually runs out of a tablet. It's a Windows app where you can go on the Windows Store and just download the app. That runs on top of the Rapid and makes it much easier. This one's a little long, uh, Nicholas. Um, the question is, we manufacture a CNC lathe for retruing locomotive wheels. We are looking for at incorporating a robotic arm with a measuring probe attached to the end so we can measure the wheel. Do you have information on a small robot we can incorporate on our machine? So I guess, uh, yes, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a traditional robots uh, that can, you know, reach half a meter all the way to, I would say, one and a half or two meters and pick up three to three kilograms all the way to, 60 kilograms that probably would fit the bill. It depends on the, on the weight and the size of the probe and how far those parts, how far, how big those wheels are and how far we need to reach. Yumi could also do that actually, uh, if the if the probe would be light enough and the the wheel are um, are within the reach of the robot, which is roughly a, a meter around a meter around the robot or a yard around the robot. And then it depends on the environment also. Is it a dirty environment or a clean environment? We, we want to look at the, but I'm definitely happy to go and take on that discussion if I understand your your process more in detail. How do I find out if Yumi is right for my operation? Well, that's a, it's a, it's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think well, first thing you want to look at is well, you want to always look at am I going to handle heavy parts or not? I mean, obviously the the 500 gram uh, payload. Gives you one a uh, gives you a certain definition of where you can utilize a Yumi. Then you wanna you wanna look at insertion forces. If you have very high insertion forces, that may not work either. But at the end of the day, if you take a small part that you, that fits in your hand and that needs assembly, odds are that typically Yumi will be suited from some parts of that assembly. Maybe some parts are too intricate, and that's where it's going to collaborate with people that may do the more intricate part, but Yumi may do the rest. One I more question. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at what, the other questions coming up. <laughs> yeah. What upcoming trade shows in the U.S. can we see Yumi in motion? So you'll see it next week at FabTech in Chicago. I will be there the whole week. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the next show. It's also, you can come to Auburn Hills in Michigan anytime for a, for a live demo if you have interest. Uh, other shows going forward, we it will be at the ATX show in California in February. And maybe at smaller smaller shows, might be going on some smaller road shows in, in between that. But the, the, the two big dates would be, and it was last week at the assembly show also in Chicago. So it's been, it was a PEC Expo. So it's been featuring left and right quite a bit. Okay, one last question. Will Yumi be sold through standard channels in the U.S., integrators or direct purchase? So Yumi is, uh, we've, we've started a Yumi the certified integrator program uh, back in September. And right now there are nine companies in the United States that are certified and trained to work and sell Yumi that understand the collaborative concepts, that understand the specificity about, you know, how Yumi works, uh, how it, is, it can be integrated with the feeders. So I'm, I'm happy to provide that list of nine uh, typical system integrators that could, uh, certified system integrators that could work with you uh, for Yumi. Uh, it's, some cases it could be sold direct, but that would, uh, that would require, of course, uh, strong self-integration skills at the plant. But, same thing, happy to take offline discussions to, uh, to assess uh, what's the right fit for your needs. Thanks, Nicholas. That's all the questions we have time for. If you still have questions, feel free to email me directly at pwarzniak at sme.org. You can connect with our team here at Fabtech in Chicago on November 9th through 12th, and we encourage you to stop by our website advancedmanufacturing.org. 
Thanks for joining us for this Advanced Manufacturing Media Webinar. We hope you found it informative.